Bears, bees, blood, and possibly the greatest rescue involving cakes ever. Join me as I talk Artemis with special guest Dr. Carla Ionescu on the Ancient History Hound podcast. Hi, and welcome. My name's Neil, and as you've probably worked out, this is a guest episode, and in this one, I'm joined by Dr. Ionescu to talk about Artemis, who is the subject of her new book, She Who Hunts. Dr. Carla Ionescu is a Romanian refugee who escaped the communist regime with her family when she was 10 years old. She is also an adrenaline junkie, an animal lover, and a natural-born storyteller. She likes to ride motorcycles real fast, and research through archival documents very carefully. Carla's research is focused on the influential nature of Artemis, both in the Greek world and in Ephesus. Her recent book, She Who Hunts, Artemis the Goddess Who Changed the World, is a comprehensive compilation of all things Artemis, filled with examples of ritual, symbolism, and cultural folklore. As one of the leading experts in the worship and ritual of Artemis, Dr. Ionescu spends most of her time teaching in the field of ancient history and women's studies and constructing the Artemis Centre, a virtual and eventual physical platform where everyone can learn, collaborate and enjoy stories of mythology and ritual culture. Carla hopes to run the centre full-time, create adventures in goddess travel and share all of her new discoveries with everyone who is passionate about ancient spiritualities and the mysteries of the Divine Feminine. So what then can you expect from our chat? Well, in our discussion, we covered a range of topics. For example, the various cults and how she was worshipped, as you'll hear, this varied hugely. There was also the matter of her depiction and her representation. Trust me when I say that the common depiction of Artemis isn't the only one. She's a deity, as you'll hear, with a range of associations ranging from the violent to the poignant. The episode notes for this will be on ancientblogger.com, but there isn't a transcription. However, there are links to Dr. Ionescu's social media, her book, and her podcast, as well as a few other bits which we mention in our conversation. I'll also stick a cake recipe on there. It crops up towards the end of our chat, and trust me, it's worth it. Now, just before we start this episode, it does include reference to violence and blood, just in case you needed to know. If you have half as much fun listening to this as I did chatting with Dr. Ionescu, then you're in for a treat. And thanks again for taking the time to download and listen. I really hope you enjoy it. And feel free to get in touch and give us some feedback. Right, here we go. Hi, Dr. Ionescu, and welcome to the podcast. Hello. Hello, Neil. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. I I read about your book and obviously what you do and thought I've got to talk to you about it. The first question I've got actually relates to this. How, and I often ask it to guests, how did you get into ancient history and how, what brought you specifically to Artemis? Hmm. And this is a great question. I get it a lot, although it does take me a while to explain because when I first went to university, I was thinking I was going to be a lawyer or a psychiatrist. It was much more, I was obsessed with law and other things. So it had nothing to do with ancient history other than like just my passion as a kid with mythology, like most of us, right? Um, So I did go to school. I did go to union. I got my first degree in psych and I worked in a pharmaceutical company for a little bit and that was terrible. And then I came back to school and I got my degree in like English and law. And I thought I'd want to go to law school and I tried a couple of legal courses and that was just too dry for me. It was no law and order kind of stuff. Um, (laughs) And so then I came back to school and I said, you know, what's really interesting to me. And so religion was interesting to me and ritual, you know, and ancient Mm. history has always been interesting. So I said, okay, let me give this a try. And so I I, uh, got a degree in religion and like religion and classics, you know. Yeah. Um, And then my father's like, what are you going to do with this degree? Uh, So there wasn't much I could do with this degree. So I went to get my master's and it was in the master's that they ask you to start focusing on something. Right. So um, I began doing because I grew up Roman Catholic. I began doing my master's on the Virgin Mary. And then one of the things that I started doing is just tracing her back like tracing the rituals, the practices back. And uh, I bumped into Artemis a couple of times. So I was like, this is really fascinating. Why does she keep showing up everywhere I'm turning? She keeps showing up, you know, the Mediterranean everywhere. 
And so I did a short paper on uh, how Artemis connects to the Virgin Mary. And then my supervisor had said, you know, this is a really good idea. Perhaps you might want to delve into it a bit deeper because no one, nothing's really been done specifically about Artemis. Uh, mm. Like the Virgin Mary has been associated with other goddesses in the past, but not really Artemis. So then I applied to get my PhD. But before I applied to get my PhD, I went on a trip uh, and I wanted to see, you know, it was my first time I went to Greece and Turkey and everything. And uh, she just kept showing up to me in the most random places, um, like the statue of Artemis itself. Like I would, we would be walking in a garden and there it would, she would be right there, which like a random garden that you never expect the statue of Artemis of Ephesus to show up. Or we would be going somewhere and there would be a painting of her just randomly in a restaurant or, you know, and I just started to feel a bit haunted. I was like, what is happening here? I've never seen this goddess in this way before in all my other travels. And so I kind of felt called to it. Yeah. So then I came back mm. and began my work. And as I began to work very seriously on sort of finding her roots and, and, and tracing her back, I realized that she was quite underestimated, uh, quite overlooked. And then it became um, a commitment, a determination that I would speak about her um, within academia in a way that I felt she wasn't spoken about before. So that was it. I just, that I became an Artemis stan yep. uh, for life. <laughs> well, that's quite a story. And I, again, I think it's really important because many people, and I've said this before, have this perception about ancient history and the classics, call it what you want, that you must be translating Cicero at the age of five. Mm. And that otherwise you're just never going to get in there. And I think if you'd listen or if you're someone who's listening to this and has listened to previous guest episodes, I think you'll find a pattern of people who are doing all sorts of things and they end up loving or falling in love with ancient history and then find a, a niche or an area of it, which they really, really find traction with. And then it becomes their thing. Uh, I know that you are a fellow podcaster. Yeah. And I know you've got a bunch load of other stuff. So before we go any further, can you tell us if people want to get in touch with you and talk to you about Artemis, how they can do that, how they can access your other content? Okay, yes, thank you. So I do. So I've just started a podcast this year. Uh, so I'm a bit new to the podcasting world. Um, and it's called the Goddess Project Podcast. It's on YouTube and also um, like I have a Twitter and um, Instagram account. And I started it because I just wanted to talk about stuff and especially like connections, both in the ancient and modern world that mm. I don't really get to talk about as much in academia or in my classes. Yeah. And so I felt like here is a platform where I can just talk about all like, did you see this connection? Then do you see how this fits here? And look at this and all the things that interest me and fascinate me, I could be talking about that and sharing with others. So I began that podcast in March and actually this week, this coming up week will be our season finale, my season finale. Oh, uh, yeah, thanks. And then I'm going to take a little break and start again, season two. I've already made a list for season two. Um, and as far as Artemis stuff, I'm sort of everywhere online under Artemis Expert. So when I publish my book, actually, I should say that my book, She oh, Will yeah. Hunt. Yep. Um, on Artemis, the goddess who changed the world. When I published my book, the publisher said, you know, one of your things is that you don't have like a brand, right? Because mm. here I am just professor at school. What do I know about building a brand for myself, right? Like I'm a bit <laughs> old school in that way. I'm like, eh. And so she said to me, you know, you need to have the same name everywhere. You need to pick a name. You need to stick with it. You need to do all these things. So uh, across the board, it's Artemis expert on all the platforms and anybody could dm or send questions or anything like that yeah you'll find the links to much of what you do or where, where people can find you on the episode notes for this podcast and that's always at ancientblogger.com there'll be links to your book links to your podcast where people can find you on instagram and other social media so thank you oh yeah your book <laughs> full disclosure i bought your book i wasn't given a, a free copy or anything and i really enjoyed it oh thank you we're going to talk about artemis we're going to talk about her in a number of different contexts across a number of different locations. If you can just tell us and just give us a brief overview, who was she, what were her main associations, her attributes, and then we can go about looking at 
everything else. Okay. All right. So Artemis, the Greek Artemis during the classical period, I would say was most famously known as the huntress or the hunter or the archer, also most famously known as the twin sister of Apollo associated with the moon. And I would say her attributes, and she was worshipped throughout the Mediterranean, although that will take us into a more uh, detailed sort of discussion. But let's say, for summary's sake, that she was worshipped across the Mediterranean during this period as a, both as a huntress, as a mistress of animals, and perhaps as a goddess of childbirth um, and protector of young, young anything, young women, young men, young animals. Uh, And her attributes are, I mean, obviously the bow and arrow. She always has hounds with her, sometimes deers, in the past lions, and the bear, which we're going to talk about. The bear actually is not depicted with her in sculpture, uh, but she is, as we'll talk about, she is very associated with bears, which is interesting. Now that I'm thinking of it, I'm thinking, uh, I can't recall a statue of her with a bear um i don't know if you can i i can no i'm trying to think right? of one. That's generally speaking it's a deer yes uh, she's got the the quiver over her shoulder always a very sort of floaty uh, i think it's a, a cheaton type that's outfit. right that's right mm-hmm. and uh, like you say a, a dog i don't mm-hmm. know if perhaps a bear is something that would be artistically difficult true, uh, true. it's possible i know that when people look at vases and when people examine vases they forget sometimes that there is an artistic representation challenge there and whether mm-hmm. or not, but that doesn't mean that they, they may not have tried. It might mm-hmm. be that it just hasn't survived. We don't have mm-hmm. it. It doesn't mean it didn't mm-hmm. exist. That's a good question. If anyone out there is listening, they know, yes, I can definitely point to a reference of Artemis with a bear that's depicted visually somewhere. Get in touch. Let us know. That'd yes, be really, really good. absolutely. Mm-hmm. So thanks very much for that summary. In terms of the other deities, did she play well with them? Did she get on? Is there much of an interaction? Was she famously associated with with some more than others? Or so I would say she is traditionally associated with her brother, of course, um, and often even, for example, when Pompey comes to mind right away, or other other. Um, I'm trying to think of a couple other places. I think at Samos as well. There is often depictions of the both of them almost like on opposite sides of temple walls right. so there's a few scenes like that um she's and often when she's out like killing people for example when they were killing niobe's children they go together or when they go and take mm. a uh, when they avenge their mother they go together uh so she is almost often associated or best associated with her brother apollo um does she play well with others I think one of the things about Artemis that's really fascinating is how independent she is. I mean, Mm. as a child, we have that story where she sits on Zeus's lap and says, you know, I want this many maidens. I want this city. I want to have this, this, this. um, And I never want anyone to bother me. And I don't have to worry about anything. And Zeus goes, yeah, okay, you can have everything (laughs) you want. Right. Um, But I, like so she's she wouldn't be closer to her supposed sisters like athena and aphrodite i don't like they don't hang out mm. uh she does doesn't always get along with hera i'm mm. trying to think who else is in there Ares, hephaestus and eh. so she is a very independent you know she's sort of the if if this was a, a family i mean we think of them as a family in a way she's sort of that kid that does her own thing or that person mm. that does her own thing you know that sister mm. that is off in another country doing some other thing and um so I would say she she gets along with the others more than not, but again is very very independent uh, and is not attached to them, other the, than her brother every now and then. The point you made about her sitting on Zeus's lap is actually I can sort of offers a, a neat little segue. There's an episode in the Iliad. Zeus goes gloves off, guys, have at it, and they That's all it. say right, let's let's get down there. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing is I'm going to shout out to Athena because Athena just drops Ares. Athena just gets a boulder, bang, puts him down. And then yeah. Aphrodite turns up to drag him away. She goes over and just, yeah, again, I'm not advocating violence against deities, but <laughs> she does. She puts her down as well, drops Aphrodite. <laughs> and then Hera turns up and Hera gets hold of Artemis. And it, the description is quite comical, I think, because mm-hmm. she says she gets both of her wrists in one hand and gets her bow and quiver and just that old phrase boxes her around the ears with it. It's basically just beats uh-huh. her up using her own That's iconography. Right. 
And then after that, Artemis is, I'm out, I've gone. And she goes back and complains to Zeus. And sort of she's at his knees complaining. And Zeus just, Zeus is by this point just laughing about it all. I mean, he's just that kind of, he's playing a part of that family member at a big event who stirred it up and is sat back watching it and loving it. Um, uh-huh. It's something, again, I hadn't noticed that level of detail. Every time I read the Iliad, I find something I haven't previously noticed, which might be my lack of attention, but it, I think it speaks to the fact that the text is so deep that it does it does give you those extra details and it rewards you every time you read it. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's a very motherly moment in a way for Hera. Uh, it's a very... Um disappointed mother or angry mother mm. kind of moment. Um, we normally see Hera so much in the wife role, right? The nagging, jealous wife role. Uh, but I think every now and then we get to see her, well, and she's sometimes also the evil stepmother, but we get to see her a bit in that mother role. But Artemis does not take that well. No. No. Uh, no. But that's a really good point you make. I hadn't thought of that. Whereas, you know, Athena picks up a rock and just drops Ares. That's full on within the context of war, because in the Iliad, again, you have that a few times. People injure and kill each other using boulders. Mm-hmm. Whereas the way that Artemis is told off is kind of reminiscent. Right. I had my ears boxed by my mum, as it were. That's right. You know? Me too. Um, I know she doesn't <laughs> listen to my podcast, so I can say that. Uh, it's That's right. exactly what Artemis gets. It's we've got the idea of a rough idea rather of Artemis in the, in the classical period and uh-huh. obviously as she's appeared in the Iliad what was she or what were her origins prior to classical Greece and where else do we see her do we find her in the other parts of the Mediterranean if so where and, and how so that's actually a, a very complicated question for Artemis because as I dug deeper and deeper into her traditions it seems that her roots are almost like if you can imagine a tree roots that is it spreads everywhere. So every little bit um, mm. of tradition can be associated to, with her. And I think that that's because her pre sort of Greek persona was mistress of animals. And yeah. almost every culture, certainly in the European, even the Middle East and other areas has a mistress of animals or a, a, yeah. a goddess of the wild. Right. And so that is very that is difficult to pinpoint down and say okay well she started here mm. so for the purpose of the book and for myself we go so we go back to the mistress of animals and then we try to connect her to different areas so for example minoan you know the minoan um uh, traditions have a mistress of the wild or a mistress of of animals um and so one of my favorite actually connections to her is that way uh Kaibali, again is sort of a more mothering uh mm-hmm. figure but she is also um, she has lions and tigers and bears and as part of her cult as well hecate again is connected to the moon and predates the greeks and so that connection to the moon that eventually uh, Artemis embodies can be traced from there. Um, and if we're talking about Artemis at Ephesus, at Ephesus um, mm. I've been reading a bit more as I'm working on this book now, Artemis in Ephesus. And uh, I can't remember the scholar's name, uh, but one of the scholars says that perhaps um, her name, Artemis, comes from Ephesus or Ephesian roots because it's not Greek. Right. Right. Okay. So, and, sorry, it's it's not an originally. So we got a similar thing to Aphrodite, which I know Aphrodite's that's name. Right. Her, her name has been argued as being non-Greek. That's oh, right. So that's the same with Artemis. That's right. That's right. Yes. Um, and so someone was arguing that this may have been actually the original. So the Ephesus and pre-Ephesus area, which is sort of modern-day Turkey, may have had the original version, if we can say, of Artemis. Which then complicates matters because the the Artemis at Ephesus is a very different divinity and embodied yeah. differently. So I think one of the mysteries of Artemis for me and one of the fascinations is trying to trace her back and seeing her um, in everything. Um, and so I think that I would lean if you if you put me in a corner and ask me I would lean towards the mistress of animals as mm. sort of the divinity that she embodies best and that remains like part Mm. of her attributes throughout the Greek world. But then when they turn her into a virginal maiden who frolics in the woods and, you know, basically doesn't do much, uh, then I become a little bit more where I'm like, uh, 
I don't know. She loses a lot yeah. of her depth that way. I think it's on the Francois Vars where she's holding, sometimes it's a stag and a lion or it's yes. two animals. And yes. just, it, it's one of those images that once you see it, you see it a lot more. It's just a beautiful image. I think possibly one of the words to associate with her from the classical period onwards is frolic. That's yes. that's what she does <laughs> pretty much. Yes. Whereas yes. prior to that, you have something very different. You know, you've got you've got a goddess holding very dangerous wild animals. Yes. You've mentioned one place which we'll probably start with, and that's Ephesus, which I was I've been mm-hmm. lucky enough to visit. It's a fascinating site if you ever get to go there. But yeah, so let's start then with Ephesus, because what one of the questions that I've had back, in fact, I've had some great feedbacks. Thank you if you've asked questions and you want to know more about this. And this is where I've been able to incorporate what you want into how the episode is, is being laid out. The cults and locations of Artemis are very, very interesting because they're very unique. They're very different and they speak to different aspects of her. And perhaps then start with Ephesus, because Ephesus is probably her most famous location i mean there was that big temple there for a start yes i think that ephesus and this is why i left ephesus for a second book because there is so much to say so i have it half written and now i'm finding some new connections and uh so i hope to have it out by next spring when i went to ephesus you know there's only one sort of column left there um, Mm. of the temple of old I would say that in Ephesus is where we see Artemis in her full power and now perhaps according to some in her original full power. And Mm -hmm. what's fascinating there is that not only she's also the mistress of animals, so that continues, the mistress of the wild, that that is there, but she's also a mother figure, Okay. you know, and uh, that really, so, you know, in the Greek Artemis, we have her as the goddess with childbirth because she supposedly came out first and helped Leto deliver Apollo. I think that's just a a simplistic Greek explanation Mm. for the power that she had as a mother figure. And in Ephesus, we see her more as sort of the godmother, the queen bee, right? So um, she feeds and nourishes and takes care of all of her, you know, worshippers or community. Mm. Um, she, I can't put into words how powerful and how unique, actually, her statue is. You're referring to the, the statue, which I think is one of those statues that people are always discussing. It's the one where you have really just a head, because the body itself is, yes. is, is very difficult in a way to describe. I'll put an image of it on the episode notes. Uh, hands are up, as I seem to remember. Mm-hmm. And then you've got... On her upper sort of torso, you've got these globes. Mm-hmm. And there's been various uh, arguments, debates about what they are. For some people, they've said, oh, they were bull's testicles because that yes. represented fertility. And I think the other one is their breast because, again, she was a, this is about her motherhood. The one that I read, and if I can find the paper, I'll link it again into the episode notes, was someone who said, if this all came about because at some point early on in her worship, there was a votive figure. And the votive figure would have been wooden. And this is another thing that people always think about when perhaps Assassin's Odyssey actually did this quite well. Statues were occasionally marble and were occasionally stone, but very often votive votive figures were wooden. Lots of votive figures were wooden and they didn't look a great deal like the deity, but they weren't meant to. They were meant to represent it in some way. And when you had her worship sort of taking over or developing from the previous Kybele or Cybelium, apologies, I never know how to pronounce it, mm-hmm. that attracted some bees. And there was a bee nest, a wild bee nest that attached itself to the votive figure. And that was seen as a blessing or as seen as divine approval, which we actually find elsewhere in ancient Greece. That's some, it's, it's quite common. Zeus was fed by wild bees. There's lots of links between bees and approval as sort of a divine right. divine mm-hmm. sign. And they said, no, this is actually wild bee larva. This is actually the nest that you would have attached to the original votive figure. And that got developed and obviously possibly lost. So people then reappropriated and said, no, perhaps they could be something else. These globes make more sense if they are bull's testicles, breasts, whatever. And it's even within the statue, there's a story of what was there before and what's there now. Because we start with, uh, I don't know if you can say much about Kybele and, and what she was and how Artemis evolved from her or had an origin in her in a site. Because I think that's mm-hmm. a real, that's the big question that I find mm-hmm. at Ephesus. Mm-hmm. 
So, uh, so, okay. So two things. So first I absolutely a hundred percent subscribe to the B theory. Um, I have a colleague that subscribes to the bull theory. So the bull theory comes from uh, 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 one of the rituals uh, where um, they would castrate a bull and throw the testicles on the statue um, for fertility rites. Oh, okay. um, yeah. And so that's why people think, oh, these must be bull testicles. I disagree because that was only that only happened in a couple of places. So it wasn't a very um, popular custom. Um, and the breast theory is a later. How do I say this nicely? Patriarchal, pseudo Christian sort of obsession with this combination of Kaivali and and Artemis. And so we don't in in the ancient statues that we found, none of them have actual like nipples. Okay. You know what I mean? So yeah. later on, like as Europeans started painting her and drawing her and even putting her in um as a fountain, like for example, all over Italy, you might find in the Tivoli Garden there's a statue of her, a fountain of her, and she's got the the bulbous sort of jacket on, but then there's like nipples and water comes out. But oh. again, that's you know 17th century yeah. imagination. So the breast thing is a much later interpretation, and so the bees to me make the most sense, and also because she's got bees up and down the sides of mm. the statue itself. But she's got mm. other animals on there. But uh, she's got that. And of course, because her priests were called Melissae yep. or Melissi. And so there's a lot of bee iconography around her. And so for me, um, that makes the most sense. And yeah. now, sorry, I forgot what your other part, the other. No, no, I'm just going to say part. about, about I, I join you on Team B. In fact, the first ever podcast <laughs> yes, episode. Team B. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I, the first ever podcast I ever did was on bees in antiquity. And I'm I, fascinated this is where I, I, I covered it briefly on that. I will. I want to find it again. I can't find the image. But apparently, Ephesian hoplites. So hoplites would have various representations of their city, city state, mm -hmm. where they were from, on their shield. And apparently, for Ephesus, it was a bee. Yes, and their coins on one side was Artemis, on right. the other side was a bee. So like there's, there's this whole real bee theme yes. running all the way through Ephesus. So. Absolutely. It doesn't make because I think otherwise you turn to people and you say you try and make the argument. You say, oh, no, there there was actually well Venus. And they look back at you and you go, no, no, hang on a sec. There's a whole bee thing that goes on in Ephesus anyway. So the, this is yes. not sort of just on its own. This stands within a wider context of bee, yes. bee culture within Ephesus. Yes. And also the, the ancients were fascinated with bees. They saw the queen bee as virginal. Right. Oh. And so they had this obsession, you know, because. And so they, they, at first they thought that, you know, bees reproduce virginally in a sense. And then uh, there's also an, like an older mythology in which they believe that like life comes out of bees. Yeah. Right. So. Well, honey um, was, so honey was something they saw as being, it never right. rotted. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't break down to anything. It was, yeah, it was used for a lot of different things. So they, they saw honey as a. Yes. It's almost a not a miraculous thing, but something that had a quality to it that you just I, I would see say, mythical. Yeah, I would say almost miraculous. I don't know if you've ever read, but at Delphi, they used to ha use fermented honey. They used to make it into a kind of incense. Oh. And there's a story, uh, Rigo Glioso, uh, the author, writes about it. There's a story that the actual prophetess or oracle at Delphi would stand on top of this sort of fermented the, oh, sorry, fermented honey concoction. And as it would smoke, it would go up into her body through her yeah, personal. Yeah. Oh yeah. And that, and that, that would uh, ins inspire or whatever, a prophecy. Right. So they always, and they always saw bees as prophetic because they thought that they could predict storms yep. and that they could predict, you know, so bees are actually much more fascinating in the ancient world. than I think we've ever really given them credit for, I think there's more information coming out now as mm. bee experts start to talk about it more. Mm. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. And Artemis was 100% associated at Ephesus was 100% associated with bees. And so to me, the most logical thing is that this jacket that she wears or whatever it is, yeah. um, is is uh full of beehives so i don't want to i don't want to anticipate or give any spoilers away for your upcoming book then but how do you find the relationship change because obviously you have a he had a, an entity there which was kaibili and now you have artemis what, yeah. what was if you could summarize if it, if you can the shift what what changed and 
yeah what was the dynamics that's there? a that's a very good question so definitely kaibeli is many breasted so okay. that is a, a change that is no, no that is a difference and uh because kaibeli is definitely again a mother goddess but with wild attributes because she has right. these two lions as well yeah. i would argue uh and people can agree or disagree that kaibeli is not so much a mistress of animals that her um essence leans more towards nurturing uh fertility earthing that kind of stuff and so i think what happens with artemis of ephesus is that she takes up a few of those attributes but has significant wild animals mm. why like a, there's a significant wildness to her that i'm not sure that kaidali has right and so artemis to me artemis is i have a friend who's also very obsessed with kaidali but to me artemis is a bit more wild is a bit more unpredictable mm. is less mothery per se like less like your mom but more like your bestie Mm. Uh, and so i find that you know i find that a little more so i think that's what makes artemis unique in that way but there are attributes there for sure because you know the greeks like and even the ancients in the mediterranean they didn't really care they didn't think the way we think about separating divinities like yeah. this yeah. one that, you know they could share attributes and they yeah. borrowed and they reinvent right so you know and so for for us now to take that apart and be like oh this is specific to this god that becomes quite difficult Yeah. We've been sold sort of the pantheon as this is a god of war, this is a god of lightning, this is a god of hunt, you know? And then when you dig deep, I guess that's simplifying it for kids, you know? Yeah. But when you dig deeper, you realize that actually the ancients took pride in changing that god for mm. them because they had to say, let's say for Artemis wherever, let's say we're going to talk about Sparta or Ravona, they would say Well, Artemis came here and she did this for us. Yeah. Therefore, she is unique to us here. Yeah. So, they took pride in that, right? It wasn't like we must have the same god everywhere. And then no. another village would say, "No, no, she came over here and yeah. then there's this legend about her, so she's, you know." Uh and that happens for all the gods, not well, just you for see, Artemis. you read just read Pausanias. And Pausanias That's is right. just Oh, this river here, this is where Artemis uh borrowed a ford fiesta went out for a weekend had a great time did <laughs> bother right. you know came back petrol tank was empty but we didn't ask questions and then someone else would say no 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 in our village five kilometers to the south she, actually, right. she was she got on a bike it was actually a tandem with apollo <laughs> and they just had a really good time because they were again driving they artemis can drive you, know, you have it. these variations and in between it all you have a local hero who was involved you know, somehow he was the mechanic because the car broke down and that's, that's why right. they worship this tree it's brilliant you just find pausanias just pick five pages and read through it and you get the idea for all everything had an association there were yeah. associations with rivers with trees with with groves with everything it's really quite nice it's quite yeah. touching pausanias is living my dream life can i just tell you that while i was doing <laughs> my phd i always envisioned myself like redoing a pausanias travel mm. you know um what an endeavor that would be take a couple of years and just go around well i've just got it. into i'm late to the party as ever i got into cruising with jane mcdonald and mm. uh, she's kind of doing that sort of thing that i would like to do although i'm not sure i'd be very good on a ship or a boat of just going around the place <laughs> and finding various things to do so there we yes. go jane mcdonald yes. or pausanias a link that yes. you won't ever hear in any other podcast again <laughs> That's right. That's so we've right. done, we've looked at Ephesus. I think there's a lot there. And hopefully, mm -hmm. perhaps when your book's out, I can get you on and we can do an entire episode. Absolutely, Or you, or yes. you will do an entire episode because obviously you have you have your podcast. I think people would be really interested in that. Yes. I'm uh, going to go across now, I think, and talk about Brauron because Brauron's one of the places where she's got a strong association and it also involves the bear which a lot of people were very interested by we've got a lot of questions about her association mm -hmm. with the bear how does it work could you talk about what the cult was at Brauron what it fun what the function of it was what the rituals and again what the what the association with the bear was I appreciate that's, that's a fair few things to go over there yes okay so so oh that's one of my favorite places um I don't know if you've ever been to Ravona Greece uh but um it's just beautiful it's actually a beach town uh oh. tourist town So when I went to, so it originally the water, the sea came right up to the temple. 
But now I would say the sea is a good 20, 30 kilometers away, if not more. And that's so just now like the temp- Ephesus. Sorry, but that's yeah, just the, when you go to right. Ephesus and they point, I thought the first time I went there, I thought they were, nah, you're having me on there. No. <laughs> but it was the same at Pompeii yeah. when I went to Pompeii. Like these yeah. rings here, because it was a harbor. Yeah. Well, no, it wasn't. But people, again, people forget <laughs> coastlines really change. When they looked That's at right. Troy, they would try to work out the coastline of Troy and they worked out that the geography of it was far different at the mythological date of Troy in the 13th century, 12th century. And it would have would have panned out completely different in terms of where the Greeks would have been and, and Troy probably was. Anyway, sorry, carry on. I was no, just, uh... it's, no, you're absolutely right. And that's exactly what happened to us. So we got to Verona and here I am getting off a bus going, wow, this is a lovely beach town and restaurants and everything, you know, and uh, but where is this temple? And then I'm asking people um, because the temple itself, uh, the, it was the original um, dig was by John uh, Papa Dimitroyo. And, but he died, you know, halfway through the dig. And so the the dig stopped and I wanted to see what had they collected, had they, you know, what had they done there since his passing? And they did a wonderful job, by the way, but you couldn't find it in Ravona. And so then I was asking people, where is this, where is this temple? And they're like, oh, just keep walking. It's a couple of kilometers away, you know? So I was like, okay, a couple of kilometers in the middle of summer in Greece. That's a lot of fun. Um, And then we get to this, place kind of like a fruit stand a couple of kilometers later we're like oh we're looking for the temple of uh, Ravona where is it they're like oh yeah keep going a couple of kilometers needless to say about 10 kilometers later we arrive at a site that is uh, completely deserted and you know of course obviously dry uh, Mm. and uh, and we see a sign for the temple and then we get to the actual temple site uh, where the runes are and there's just a few runes anybody can google it and find there's just a few runes left and so I took a bunch of pictures there and, and all that kind of stuff. And then I asked the, there's an attendant there who actually saw my mother and I, my mother was with me and saw us and we had walked for so long. She's like, you want some water? And they gave us some water. It was very sweet. Oh. And then I said, you know, I know there's a museum here somewhere for everything that they found. <laughs> she looks and she goes, yeah, it's just a couple of more kilometers that way. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was. So I went in they did. They really did. They really did. Uh, I went in and no one was there. It was empty, which is my favorite thing. And yeah, so, that's what, so that's wonderful when you go somewhere and, and you're isn't you're it? in the museum or somewhere on your own. I, I know it's going to sound horrible, very selfish, but it, you just, <laughs> yeah, you have that moment when you're in a museum or somewhere like that on you or, or even a, a site, you're completely on yeah. your own. Anyway, sorry. So I went in and this is where I found, uh, where they found and they had to put them in the museum. All of these figurines, so there were animal figurines, people figurines, oh, okay. uh, especially children figurines. So, and then I was like, okay, this is really, really fascinating. So, what the ritual that happened at, in this temple was what we call sort of the temple of the bears. And in short, it was a place where young women would come to leave behind their wildness of their childhood and be initiated into womanhood. Hmm. And some of the ways that they did that, so that's one of the, that's a major sort of festival or rituals that happened there. And they would be dressed in these saffron dresses and they would um, walk around, dance around, depends on what you read, and offer, make offerings to the goddess. What they would offer is interesting. They would offer things like their childhood toys, their childhood clothes. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Or they would offer little statuettes of things that they loved. Um, and so Artemis here is in charge of the initiation of young women. Now, there is a discussion that um, that this is also the place in which Artemis may have initiated young men as mm-hmm. well. Again, same thing from childhood into into manhood. So it was a it was a very str- uh, a stronghold for this initiation. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing that happened here. So lots of things happen here is that. If a mother had a child or if a child was sick or anything like that, they would create statues of the child if they had money Um, or if they didn't have money, they would offer something else and they would leave it in the temple so that Artemis would protect that child for life. And so this is why we have so many little kids statues. So those statues weren't, they were based on real real people. That's That's right. Wow. That's right. And so there was a whole industry, a whole industry of um, ceramic workers mm. 
where depending on how much you could afford. So if you didn't couldn't afford much, you just got like a standard kid, let's say. Yeah. But if you could afford more, they would shape this child into your child, you know, mm-hmm. so it would look like your child. And so there is a col- that I, I would say that's one of the largest collections of what people would offer to Artemis. Um, and it's fascinating. It's fascinating. I, I think I took pictures of literally the entire. Were these museum. all in the in the museum there? Yes, and everything you, that that survived. And you're in the museum on your own. Knowing that, yeah. I would be spooked yeah. out. That would spook me out. No, no, I was looking <laughs> at something that was based on a a child from that many, uh, obviously from from that period. Just yeah. that link right there. I would, I would be drawn to it i'd want to be in there don't get me wrong but that would i'd have hairs on the back of my neck going up because i don't know perhaps i've watched too many horror films but <laughs> one of those statues just winks or hang on said the head moved oh my god it's yes. just that sort of no. <laughs> but we get this is what i find beautiful about ancient history we look at these we have these big dominant columns you've got the big temples you've got everything else but the uh-huh. things that make it real are the the poignancy of a of a intimate object. Something you can say that was based on someone. Someone held uh-huh. someone held that. And okay, it might have been the really really um, cheap version. It might be the expensive version. But someone sat and and fashioned that based on uh-huh. a human that existed. And now you're yes. looking at it. Yes. You think that's spooky? This is also where they performed uh, human sacrifices, right? Uh, so okay. this is where the Taurian Artemis was originally brought, which is sort of what yeah. makes Bravone uh, so um, so interesting. And there's sort of an orgiastic, mystical ritual around her. And w- we're told that there was initially human sacrifice. Mm. Um, and that even that people would, that the people in this area would actually throw others like foreigners or strangers you know people outside the village off the cliffs yeah uh, in sacrifice to the Torian artemis and it is associated with bears and so that for example the young women were considered bears and i don't think that people think about bears when they think about greece but there were actually yeah populations of bears in in greece back in the day um when i did my research on bears in greece they still have conservation sites where there are bears in northern in some of the northern forests um, like north, like in the Thessaloniki area. Do we know what type area. of bears? Sorry, do we know they're what type brown of... bears. Brown bears, brown okay, bears. cool. Yeah, they're brown bears. So, but we're told that historically they might have come even lower. So now they're mm. like sort of the Thessaloniki area, north of Thessaloniki in those forests. Yeah. Uh, but we were, were, we are, at least we think, that they came or they were around in much more of the southern areas, just as the deer were, right? Like when you, yeah. you don't see deer now in Greece very much. Again, you have to go north. Um, and so, and I know that someone had asked something about bears and they were asking like, yeah. what's the bear connection? Yeah. And the bear has always been, even in like Northern European, Eastern European and other, uh, sort of early pre-Roman tribal cultures, bear has always been this, especially the she bear has always been this mystical figure of both protection, mm. mothering, power, there are stories of bears, like of people welcoming bears into their homes, especially when they're pregnant wow. uh, or touching bears, uh, because I guess mother bears are so protective of their cubs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yet so powerful and fearsome. Hmm. Um, and so bears have and actually I just posted a video today on my Instagram of uh, this bear cave that I found in Crete for Artemis. And you have to go like, anyway, you have to it's quite a hike down and you have to like figure out it's in it inside this massive cave but there's a there's a natural lime limestone uh build that mm. looks like a white bear that is oh. climbing into a pool of water like that's sort of miraculous like if you're in the ancient world and you walk into this cave and there's this limestone figure yeah that's miraculous right i mean you're, you're going to rationalize like that through myth or you're right? going to rationalize it through some yes. divine that's right Absolutely. that's right and when i walked in myself i thought oh my like this is so random and the cave is mm. dark everything is black and you have this in the middle of the cave you have this what looks even today as a white bear climbing into a pool of water and there the same kind of ritual was done but the girls would go up the stairs beside the bear and go into the pool and come out on the other side and that was sort of an initiation 
right. But again, another cave bear uh, or bear imagery to Artemis. So bears were her symbol uh, for a long time. And as a side note, I got to tell you, before I started being more like talking about Artemis in my life, just like a few months ago, because then up until then I was doing more academic stuff. Well, here's Artemis, here's A, B, and C. I had this dream, Neil, and I don't remember my dreams. I'm one of those people that never remembers them. But I had these dreams where bears were breaking into my house. And I was like, I was walking from room to room trying to kind of get away from them. They weren't trying to hurt me, but they would just turn the door and come after me. And I would go into another room and they would turn the door and come after me. And I woke up like just remembering this vivid dream. And the first thing that came to mind is like, Artemis is coming for me. She's like, yo, like you need to go out there and like talk about my stuff and get my stuff. You know, it was the first kind of dream that I had where I was like, oh my God, like now she's just really saying, you know, get my stuff out there. Anyway, that's a side kind of rant. On, no, but that... it's just, I, I never had a dream about bears in that way. Like, you know, <laughs> I'm going to probably have a few nightmares about those child <laughs> statues or star child <laughs> statuettes. That'll be, so thanks for that. I'm going to hit the coffee <laughs> straight after this and no sleep for the next few days. While you were talking about bears and you were saying that they were far more prevalent than people think of now. I I think I saw something recently on social media and someone was asking about lions. And again, people didn't realize that there were lions in in ancient Greece. In fact, Herodotus made a comment about them when you had the Persian invasion. Mm -hmm. And they were actually predating on lots of the camels. They found the camels easy pickings um, on the the Persian baggage trains. So the idea, again, that we have the sort of different type of animals than we currently would expect to see in that part of the world. And something else you mentioned, it was about sacrifice. Now, I did an entire episode on human sacrifice. There are instances where we find Artemis in and around human sacrifice. Yes. Possibly the most famous instance is with the Trojan War, where you have Iphigenia being sacrificed. In some myths, as Iphigenia was about to be killed, Artemis appears and replaces her with, actually snatches her away and replaces her with a deer. Yes. And she takes her away. And you have Euripides, uh, Iphigenia at the Taurus, which actually explains that she's then taken all the way to the Taurus, which is, if, if you're not aware, the cr- modern Crimea. Mm-hmm. And that's apparently where her worship or worship was was thought to have been at. And there is this element of, of sacrifice, human sacrifice. So you mentioning that, and there's another bloody example I'm using that's not me swearing that's that's the correct term that we'll come to in a moment to do with Artemis Mm -hmm. which Mm -hmm. again when you talk about that family member who's just that bit different from everyone else she's got that in her her game somewhere just that Mm -hmm. that relevance to human sacrifice I I was going to say briefly mention Taurus or Taurian you've you've said Mm -hmm. it or Taurian Artemis now this is to do with as I said the Crimea is there much on her that we know about so we know that there that there was human sacrifice for her, and mm. we know that she arrives at Ravon, or Baron, and we know that then she is then the, that sort of the Baron she becomes the Baronian Artemis there, and then that that representation ends up in Sparta. So it's a bit yeah. of sort of um, it's not a reincarnation, but it's a, a connection between yeah. all of them, right? So she arrives in one place, she's worshipped there. She moves to another place, she's worshipped there, and we know that all of the rituals that took place for this particular, let's say, readaptation were bloody. Mm, or many yeah. of them were bloody. Like there were bloody rituals yeah. for for all of them. And in fact, I can think of at least three places where there were human sacrifices uh, right off the top of my head. Uh, so t- there are a lot of stories of human sacrifice for Artemis. Mm. Um, and I'm not an expert in other gods quite the way that I am with her, um, and I know that there are other gods that also had human sacrifices, but for her, I don't think that people expect it. You no, know? again, we, we, how would you if the word that we associate her, which we've we've decided is going to be associated with her, is frolicking? You don't ex- expect a character with that representation to have that mm. kind of backstory. And I'm glad you mentioned Sparta because I would say if you went to people and said. Okay, Sparta, you've got six packs, you've got a load of stuff that never happened, but people think it did. Mm-hmm. Name name a really important deity. Name your top or one of the top deities for Sparta. People are going to be going 
whoever the god of six packs was, um, Ares. <laughs> they don't realise Artemis was pretty much one yeah. of the crucial deities worshipped yeah. at Sparta. We don't realise that she was really fundamental to Sparta. Yeah. So perhaps we can talk about Sparta in particular, linking in with Orthia, which was a mm-hmm. a particular my favourite festival involving punishment and cheese yeah see if we could just talk about how she was found at sparta and orthia yes okay so sparta so when people think about sparta even when i thought about sparta for a long time i thought about athena right because you're like oh the spartans like to fight and da 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 yeah and imagine my surprise as a young person doing research when i found that in fact the spartans worshipped artemis before battle before each battle, they worshipped Artemis. So then I fell down this kind mm. of rabbit hole going, what? What are you talking about? Why? Same kind of situation, right? How does that work? And, uh, you know, Artemis Orthia is sort of the goddess that stands erect, right? Because she, her statue was said to literally just have been a pole. Yeah. Again, another fascinating aspect, because when you look at, when you want to look up Artemis Orthia, there's a couple of small, tiny little woodcuts of her mm. there. But there really isn't a really big accumulation of images of Artemis at Sparta. And so you don't know what she kind of looks like. And the little woodcuts that we do have in the museum in Athens are basically just almost like a, a, a pole woodcutting with a head kind of thing. Yeah. Right? And that that's all that she is. And so people are like, that's interesting because it's not like the huntress frolicking no. virgin that we're talking about. It looks a bit, I, I think I've seen one of those and it looks a bit like those sort of Scandinavian chess pieces yes you might have seen exactly yes it doesn't look if you were shown this and said you probably wouldn't even think it belonged to Greek mythology or Mm -hmm. or Greek sculpture but it is Mm -hmm. not everything in ancient Greece was nice chiseled marble or stone it could be representation through a type of votive figure that we don't always see and would have been more perishable because it was wooden it wasn't a nice lovely yeah. statue that the romans right. would copy or the greeks would have in a temple it could just be a wooden votive figure that obviously is going to degrade it's not going to last that's right and i also think there's this misconception about pagans particularly around the idea that pagans worship the statue as like the god itself which is a weird it's a complex way of thinking of it but mm. Yes, they do and they don't kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like, obviously, Mm. this is a representation of the God, but not literally a God, right? And so sometimes I think we get confused when we think about, well, what would a wooden statue that's just a pole mean to them? Well, it meant everything because that was the way that they honored. And so her ritual there starts out of an interest. It starts out of a a battle that took place in the area, um, lots of tribal war that was happening in there. Um, and there was a lot of sort of violence and death. And after the slaughter, like after the violence and death that it initially was happening in the area, the, an Oracle said, you know what, if we soak this idol, let's say of Artemis in blood, she may help us either win the battle or create a, a moment of peace, whatever. So then they began doing this by killing one person. So they would kill one person and then they would soak the wooden idol with blood uh of course then that was starting to look you know it was frowned upon over time so what they did is they did this fascinating ritual where they'd have all these young boys in almost like a coliseum kind of amphitheater area and they would walk around the statue these young boys and they would whip themselves okay bloody and the last one standing would be the most honorable. So they would all start passing out because they would bleed so much. And the last one standing uh, would be sort of the most honorable and their family would gain all of this honor. And the priestess of Artemis um, at Sparta would hold the idol. So the idol is not massive. I don't know what, you know, people say different things about it, but enough that a, a woman would be able to hold it out, Right. Yeah. Uh, so she's holding it out in front of her while these boys walk around her and the idol whipping themselves. And she would like as, as she was getting tired holding it, obviously, she would sort of entice them to go faster, 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 faster. So you can imagine all these men whipping themselves into a frenzy. Mm. Slowly, they would start passing out. Of course, the first one to pass out, their family sort of loses face. And, and the priestess and the idol would be covered in blood. And then there would be one last man standing. And that was sort of the winner. And they did this every year. 
mm. every year. Um, so, she, so I would say in this case, she's a super bloody yep. goddess. But also the weird thing for me is like the way that you almost beat your young men in senseless before the war or in preparation for a war. It's kind of mm. a weird, you know, well, the boys were about 14, but still for Spartans, that was a grown man. Yeah. Um, so, so she, because so she has this sort of bloody history that I don't think we read about. I should just add that the link with cheese is that this was adapted later. I believe, I think it's Xenophon who mentions it. And it's certainly mentioned by Pausanias where these young Spartans were trying to get to a platform where they had lots of cheese and you'd have people on the platform with whips mm -hmm. and the person who could get the most cheese and endure the most pain was seen as the most honorable. So we've, we've looked at the Spartan Artemis. We're going to go outside of Greece because there was a question about this. And I think this is a, 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 was a very good question about Artemis in Southern Italy and in particular Sicily. Mm -hmm. So what have we mm -hmm. got for her in, in Sicily? I think it's Syracuse, Syracuse, which is yes, Syracuse. most strongly associated with it. Yes, 100%. I think th so th she was worshipped at Syracuse and in and, and parts of Sicily as Agrotera and Sotera. So, and there's a there's actually an, um, a little image, a little statuette that it was found uh, there about 400 BCE, uh, where she's just kind of riding a deer and it was found in Syracuse. Uh, it's in Italy now. And I will argue that she would worship there more as Agrotera or mistress of animals or mistress of the wild. Okay. Um, because I think that's the aspect that we see on some coins of her. And I think that's the aspect that the Romans, particularly here, or the Syracusans, let's say more correctly, really enjoyed. So they really enjoyed her aspect as a mistress of wilderness and that sort of wildness. There was still a little bit of the childbirth protectress of it. Um, she was still seen as a virginal maiden there as well. Um, mm -hmm. But she was very strongly uh, venerated for her control, <clears throat> excuse me, of the wild and untamed places. Okay. Um, as, so as Soteria, she is, and Soteria is sort of a savior which is another fascinating aspect for me of Artemis. There she, in, in that kind of, let's say, incarnation or association, she's associated with Apollo. Mm. Um, and again, sort of, in, sometimes she's associated with, with Leto, of course, uh, as their parents. But I think that that sort of mistress of the wild and mistress of the animals or like that Cognatheron kind of mm. incarnation is what what she was mostly attested to in Syracuse. Uh, and so far, what we found, we found a little bit, mostly coins and, like I said, a statuette. Uh, so I think she's similar to what we've been talking about. Hmm. The Romans really enjoyed her stories of blood sacrifice, hmm. uh, although we don't have any evidence that there was human sacrifice to her there, like in hmm. Syracuse. And we are told, actually, that her temple... What am I saying? We are told. I don't know who tells. Us. Anyway, classicists believe. <laughs> <laughs> like so, we're told. Uh, classicists believe that um, her temple there, the Temple to Artemis Agrotera, there is the first building to be built on in Sicily. Wow! Really? Yeah, like the first temple building. Sorry, oh, my apologies. Not, okay. not no, like no, no. housing. Yeah, yeah. But the okay. first temple building or like worship building. There are people that say that the people that came to Sil well, lots of people say that people that came to Sil Sicily came from Malta. Mm. So there were whoever inhabited the, you know, and whoever built those stone temples in Malta that are sort of Neolithic, mm. that the generations of those individuals then went to Sicily. So there are some arguments that, oh, they may have built other things before this temple to Artemis that we haven't found yet. So there is that argument. Mm. But most classics, most classics agree that the that sort of first temple to a divinity that was ever built in Sicily was the Artemis Agrotera. Oh, it's pretty cool. I, I found out just doing some reading and I found mm -hmm. a, an interesting reference to a sanctuary of Artemis as being near mm -hmm. Regium in southern Italy. So we're, we're talking about Magna Gratia here. That's referenced in Thucydides where he's talking about the Sicilian expedition. The Athenians stayed over and they, they couldn't find anywhere to stay, basically. And they camped mm -hmm. near the sanctuary of Artemis. So there was evidence of her and I, I did some reading did try to do some research there's lots of inferred or implied yes uh, worship of her there's nothing 
substantial. I mean, think that if you're going to look for Artemis in southern Italy and Sicily, you're looking at Syracuse. Whereas yes. in southern Italy, there is still elements of her. They've found terracottas, I think it's Heraclea. It shouldn't be that much of a surprise because if you go further north, you've got the Etruscans. And the Etruscans yes. had their version of Artemis. Um, yeah. It's called Artemi or Artumes. And she was, again, she had a similar function in that she was uh, associated strongly with animals, particularly wolves, apparently, which mm -hmm. uh, if you're looking at Rome is, is, is very, uh, very apt. Yes, right. A part of my uh, research trip was going to be in Sicily and Syracuse to kind of see what, what's around there. Mm. I went to Malta and then to Crete and whatever uh, a couple of summers ago, but then the pandemic movement like made movement around very complicated yeah. and Italy was shut down for a while. So I didn't get to go to Sicily uh, or Syracuse there, but I would love to go there next and kind of see things for myself. And, you know, local legends are always yeah the most amazing ways to learn things about yeah. past there so that would be really fascinating i don't know I'm, i was really glad that someone asked questions about sicily and southern italy mm. so that people are aware of that and it's no judgment on anyone but you think of ancient mm -hmm. greece mm -hmm. and you you overlay that with modern greece as a geographical yes. con concept you, you don't think of sicily you don't think of the black sea you don't think of north africa at cyrene for yes. example these sorts mm -hmm. of places so we've looked at the cults or we've we've covered some of those cults which again all fascinating i think you could probably do an episode in each to be totally honest with you Yes. One of the central tenets of her and associations that she's very strong with are the different stages of womanhood, as is probably best exemplified in Brawn. You've got the, the, the change from girl to, to woman. Uh, but there's also, like you said, uh, you, rather you have mentioned about her, the motherhood, childbirth, all of this. And yet alongside this, she's a deity whose virginity is very, very important or is given great weight how how does that work how did that how is the interaction between those different concepts not not necessarily contradictions because some people could see them as contradictions but there's obviously associations there that work how how do yes. they work so okay that was one of my questions too because when i was looking into the virgin mary and i kept finding associations between the virgin mary and artemis both at ephesus and some of the greek artemis i thought to myself how is that possible she's never had a child uh, so how can Artemis be both virgin and mother? And there's a couple of ways that that can happen. The very first one, I think, the most basic one is the concept of parthenogenesis in Greek myth, which is the idea that, for example, a goddess can give birth on her own, like Hera gives birth to Hephaestus, for example, or like Gaia gives birth to Uranus, her concert, before they begin birthing other things. Mm. And so... This concept that a divinity can have spontaneously birthed children um, was something that might have been or was common to the Greeks. However, that being said, Artemis literally does not have a child. Um, and so, again, mm. that comes up. OK, the other. So the second part of that is her virginity. And I think we both know that virginity in ancient Greece was not associated with a hymen or like physical virginity, but rather uh, virginity is a word for independence that is non-married, not married, mm. uh, never married kind of mm. thing. And so Athena is seen as a virgin and uh, Artemis is seen as a virgin. And so I don't think that the term virginity necessarily applies to her ability to be mother. So then we get into the, the sort of, again, reincarnations or associations with previous goddesses. And so, for example, in Crete, she is often associated with Eletheia. So Eletheia was a goddess of childbirth and a goddess of protectors of childbirth. Then we have her, the story that the Greeks give us that she literally is born before Apollo and helps birth Apollo. Mm. Um, and so there again, we have this association with not herself having a child, but being the primary person at childbirth. Yeah. Right. And so then it makes sense that, it, I guess it kind of makes, because there's no one else there, I'm trying to think, there's no one else there that the Greeks pray to for the actual inception, right? What they're praying for is simply fertility, let me have children. And then once they become pregnant, they go, let me carry this child to term safely, let me birth this child safely. That's mm. where Artemis comes in. She comes in the part where it's like, let me carry the child to term, let mm. me birth the child to term. And so those then are because she helped a god being birthed. And there's lots of other village stories 
in which she helps mothers in birthing uh, or the children are born successfully because Artemis was there. And so that association becomes so powerful that she doesn't need to have children um, to be the protectress of childbirth. Um, And Oh, I see. So really the weight that she has within that context is because she's fulfilling a function. Uh, yes. rather than I need to evidence my worth in this particular scenario by having lots of kids I don't yes. need to evidence on the back of that I evidence on the back of the fact that I'm the person who will help you have a healthy child and yourself That's and right. yourself remain healthy during that process I see okay yes yes and so it's very fascinating how the Greeks thought about this because so for for example, in many feminist cultures, we have this this almost like not a resentment, but a push against women being identified as you know just mothers or just reproducers. Um, and it's fascinating to me that in the ancient world, Artemis, who is not a mother herself, doesn't birth a child herself, does have authority over this, and the Greeks see no problem with that. I think for us, we see a problem where like, well, if you're an, you should be a mother if you are an authority over children. But for the Greeks, absolutely not. That's not necessary. The fact that she's a protectress of childbirth, but then also the one that initiates children into adulthood. So she saw, she's almost like the sort of magna matter of mm. children, mm. right? Everything, and, and that goes, like I said, even for, for child animals, let's say, or whatever, puppies or cubs or whatever. So she has this umbrella authority over any youth that has not come to maturity. And that's from childbirth to that. And the Greeks didn't have a problem with that. Like for them, it didn't, you know, like she doesn't have to be a wolf to take care of cubs or protect them, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think when we say the word virgin, like I said, we automatically make her into a 15 year old. And so Mm -hmm. then in our minds, it's like, how is she in charge of childbirth? Yeah. But she's, you know, she's a serious divinity. She is a grown, fully aggressive, you know, fully matured divinity. And again, something you your book really, really works on to explore is she's someone who has got very much what we would consider a dark side. Mm-hmm. It's, yes. She has this part to her which is excised quite cleanly from more modern understandings and retellings of her as a kind of Phoebe from yes. Friends, happy clappy, let's go yes. on a picnic. I, I'll, yes. I'll put my hand up and a, a bird will land on it and we'll all be friends. Yes. They yes. forget the other side to her. Yes. And the interesting thing is, you know, as a mother myself and as, as, you know, women, when we think about a goddess that we would want to be protected by, it is a goddess that has a very strict, a very aggressive dark side. Like that's who mm. you want as your yeah, protector. Yeah. Certainly you don't want the maiden and frolicking in the woods. I mean, she's nice. It's cute. But, um, and so, <laughs> yeah. it, you know, she's cute. She's wonderful. But, I want a bear, not a butterfly, you know. Right, exactly. <laughs> like, if you're in the woods and you want to meet Artemis, that's lovely. But I think for women, I don't think it's as much of a problem when we talk about, although, like I said, like this is a generalization, but when we talk about a dark goddess protecting us, I think I think I would feel safer that way. Perhaps, I really I need to use a different term. Not, not a dark goddess, but a very powerful, effective goddess. A, like you say, a protector. Someone who's able to protect yeah, I mean, and I mean, the fact that she's called savior mm. is very interesting to me, you know, because technically, you know, as a Christian, you grew up savior, savior is Jesus, right? Mm. Um, but the fact that she is prayed to as savior. So again, she's saving people. She yeah. kills people. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we don't want well, to yeah. sugarcoat it. Yeah. <laughs> but she's also seen as savior. And so, yeah, I think she needs to be intense because when you're in childbirth and you don't know if you're going to live or die or your child's going to live or die, you want to call out to a goddess that's going to come and, and handle business, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think that's part of my fascination with her is that the more I dig, the more I find layers to her. Yeah. Um, and then I have to sort of reimagine and rethink the way even I have thought about her for so long. You mm. know? I had a question about her relationship because we've obviously got her very much couched with within her relationship with women what was her relationship with men oh, obviously we've seen the the instance at sparta were there any other ways that there was interaction with with men you, you mentioned that brawn there could have been male initiations going on as well is there mm-hmm. yeah. so there is there's many 
there's many, and Pausanias can attest to this and does attest to this, sorry. Um, there's many instances where men are actually the primary builders of or establishers of temples to Artemis. So she actually speaks to men and this may be a social, cultural, historical thing where men were the builders and mm. they say Artemis speaks there. But there are many instances where men are building the temple or inspired by her to build temples. Right. There are many instances where men are inspired or saved by her either in battle or just in mm. traveling. And then they, they build a temple to her in honor of her. I don't think that Artemis denies men in any way other than those that trespass on her yeah. private space, yeah. right? But I think there are many worshippers of Artemis. I mean, like I said, the ancient Greek men worshipped goddesses without the fear of yeah. being emasculated, right? Because that wasn't an issue for them at all. That wasn't a thing. And I suppose the other example was the Spartan army, or rather them sacrificing to Artemis. There's a distinct link then between men in yes. the field and, and yes. a goddess, which is... Yes, uh, and of course the very the very purpose of sacrifice is that you gain the God's favor. Yeah. And so the yeah. fact that she favors them yeah. uh, in battle, you know, uh, in many battles, again, is this link between her and how, and, and the fact that she also initiates boys and there are places where boys are initiated. And actually, you know, that story, I wrote that story in my book where uh, the 300 boys that were taken to be castrated, she was really upset. Right. So it's the festival of Elaphobia. I don't know if you if, if you remember it, but and that's where they have the little cakes that they eat for her, which are basically little deer cakes. They're super cute and supposedly delicious. And that was for the <laughs> I haven't had any. And that was for the Samian rescue of those 300 boys. So Herodotus tells the story that the Corinthians had captured 300 sons of these this nobility, and they were offering them to be eunuchs. Oh, okay, in the city of Aliatis, and then. They were escorting the boys on the way there and they stopped in Samos. Now in Samos, there was a huge temple to Artemis, mm. massive temple to Artemis, of course. And the Samians were horrified that these boys were going to be castrated. So who did they turn to to protect these prisoner right. boys? It's Artemis, right? Mm. And so what they did is they hid the boys in the temple of Artemis. Mm. And then the Corinthians were like, well, that's fine. You can hide them in that temple all you like. But they're going to starve, right? Because you're not going to be able yeah. to feed them, yeah. right? The Corinthians couldn't enter the sanctuary. Yeah, I think that's right? that's the important point to make. For anyone listening, if you, you were able to enter a sanctuary, you could not be forcibly removed because it was seen as that's one of right. the gravest acts you could do. That's why, in case you're thinking, well, they could just go in and get them. No, they couldn't. But obviously, that's if you're right. in a sanctuary, it could be in prison. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And so what the Corinthians do is they block all the food from going to the temple. Yeah. So they're like, okay, we're going to starve these boys out. And the young men and women in the town of Samus create a dance around the temple in which they hold out cakes oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. for Artemis. For yeah. Artemis. So yeah. again, the Corinthians didn't dare take no. the cakes, but I mean, they couldn't bring bags of food, but they brought these little cakes. And so imagine young boys and girls just kind of dancing around, holding cakes out on both their hands mm. around the temple. And the 300 boys that were in the temple would be able to step out and steal the cakes. Right. Okay. Right. Mm. So this happened for months and months and months until the Corinthians were like, okay, screw it. We're going to give up yeah. the boys. Um, and so this, yeah. So this is a, a, a massive uh, legend at Samos uh, in which one could argue Artemis not only defends boys, but protects them, especially from, you know, forced castration, which is, you know. And so there are instances in which her temple or her worship plays a key role in saving, let's say, the masculine or, or men. I would put it out there as well. That's probably the best myth involving cake. If anyone knows <laughs> of a better myth that involves cake or baked goods, yeah. let me know. I don't know of a better one. I did not know that one. I did yeah. not know. And yeah, I, it's, it's annoying because I love cake. Yes, it's one of my favorites. Uh, and I actually looked up and there's a recipe for these cakes as well. Really? Uh, online. Yes. And they're like, I, they're like a little bit like honey cakes. Okay. So send me the link. Delicious. I'm going to put that in the episode notes. If you send me the link to that, I will put that in the episode notes and mm -hmm. you can, uh, yeah, try them out. Lovely. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one of my favorite uh, myths because it's so uh, strategic and smart, you know, mm. and yet it involves, of course. So obviously the Corinthians who are quite an impressive 
culture yeah. did not dare step into the sanctuary, no, no. did not dare stop this dance that they were doing in honor of mm. her, um, and eventually gave up uh, their prisoners. They returned, or the Samians returned the boys back to their home. And so the boys mm. went home after and they were free. Uh, but it's a great story. It's a great story. And, is, it's, is uh, and it's kind of nice as well, because we're coming to the towards the end of the episode and it was going down a place of bloody <laughs> statues. <laughs> Um, right general general unpleasantness so it's nice to to sort of end it as it were on cakes yes. i'm going to finish up with a question okay what are the misconceptions about artemis what do you think they are so my like my two pet peeves are her virginity the the constant uh and her age yeah and so i can get around the virginity a little bit because you know she doesn't have children so it's not really mm. an issue about that but I but I would like for people to know that she could have had a sexual life. And in mm. fact, there's a lot of modern uh, scholars that are looking at her sort of just having an intimate relationship with women. And perhaps she just didn't oh. want to have intimate relationships with men mm. because she's always surrounded with her female companions and very possessive uh, oh. of her female companions uh, and even punishes some of them for having uh, relationships with men now in the the old sort of religious traditions they saw this as oh you know they're breaking their virginity but there are some new suggestions that maybe she's just jealous that those are okay. her lovers yeah. right so and so so uh, the fact that she's a virgin in quotation marks does not mean that she's not a sexual being yeah let's say or div- divinity yeah. so that's my first one but i would say my the mo- the the one that's that really i would take away is just her age yeah. Like I know we call her a maiden, but a maiden can be a 25 year old or 27 yeah. year old. Yeah. I, mean, I even a 30 year old depend. You know. Uh, I mean, these are gods, right? So mm. I, I, I don't mind. And again, nothing against anybody who feels like so. There's a young person that feels like they connect to her in that mm. youth way. I think that's wonderful. But I, I just don't want her to be limited to that. That kind of hurts me sometimes. And I guess the last one would be the frolicking, you know, yeah. in the sense that she. I don't mind the frolicking, and I think we all like to frolic yeah. in, the, in the forest every now and then. So again, it's not. I guess it's not. It's just the limitations around her. I feel like she's really been. It's just now that people are really starting to dig into her more and learning that she's more mm. complex than what we originally thought. So I think the limitations placed around her, like I find it a little frustrating sometimes to go through museum after museum after museum and see the same image with her reaching for an arrow with, yeah, a, yeah. with a stag or, the, you know, yeah. I love the image. It's wonderful. We're glad we're happy to have them. But um, there were other depictions of her that we so far have not found or mm. maybe are lost. And I think that would have given us a more complex sort of idea of her, a more full bodied idea, idea of how she was worshipped. I think that what you've been able to share on this podcast has given i think there'll be many people who are listening and probably haven't realized and welcomed the idea that she has much more uh of a of a wider depiction characterization she's much more of a fuller entity than just the one type um i didn't know it as much i expected to find that she was layered i expected to uh to find her as a different character a different entity I didn't realize how different. I think that was the thing that I found the most fascinating. And again, because how well you deal with it in your book, she isn't just this one type of character. And I think that's really important. So I think if there's one thing that you can take away it would be what, what you've just spoken about. The fact that she's not just this sort of teenage girl sort of frolicking in the woods with, mm-hmm. with a bow and arrow and a friendly and sort of comedic animal giving wisecracks. She's much mm-hmm. more than that. There's an entire backstory there that is far more interesting. Far more interesting. Yes. 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 I think, yes. I think you've summed that up really brilliantly. Um, um, I think that that's, and that's, I think that's what the bears in my dream is, uh, you know, in the sense that. Uh, we're not, we're not going she's... on dreams now because I just about <laughs> forgot the nightmarish <laughs> things that I will have to endure now. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, look, I, I just want to say I really appreciate you taking the time to come on and speak as as you have done on Artemis. Again, if you're going to find the notes to this, they'll have all the links, including the cake. Yes. I w- I'm definitely going to try that cake. It will go hold wrong, but I'm going to give it a go. Mm-hmm. And that's all on ancientblogger.com. Find all the links there. Um, 
I would love to have you on again, uh, but I appreciate you have your own podcast, and therefore you you'll probably you oh, probably got a great yeah, job. But no, perhaps when no. you've done the book on Ephesus, <laughs> we can talk about bees. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that would be fantastic. Yes, you know, I don't I don't think that intellectual discussions need to be limited. I would love to. We could talk about all kinds of things, uh, and I we can do it both on yours and mine. It's really fun. Just not yeah. dreams. No more dreams. That's just not dreams. Because sometimes when you talk by yourself and you're presenting something, it's fun. But when you're having a conversation with someone else, you know, you're like, oh, yes, oh yeah, exactly. totally. you know, you're, it's, yeah. I predominantly do my stuff solo. And it's mm -hmm. at points, it's fun. It's always fun. Otherwise, yes. I wouldn't do it because I'm not doing it for the money and the fame. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> but when you get to talk to people, you can have a, it can be a bit different and it's nice. Yeah and it's it's welcome you know, yeah it is exactly. welcomed particularly when you're throwing yeah. ideas around you can be far more forgiving when you're uh, we're having a discussion with people when, yeah. about this sort of thing and again yeah. if you've taken the time to listen to this because i realize it's coming up now I, I i don't know i'll probably edit this down a bit but you've spent i would say well over an hour listening to us i really appreciate taking the time because there are so many podcasts at the moment that are out there that people are saying listen to this and listen to this if you like this please leave a review if you can do so and also check out um, Dr. Ionescu's podcast as well and leave a review when you can. Um, I will say my goodbyes and thanks again for everyone listening. Thanks again, Dr. Ionescu. Really appreciate it. Thank you so your, much. Thank you, your, everyone. Your expertise. And until next time, sweet, I say sweet dreams, but have fun with <laughs> cake. <laughs> <laughs>